Hello and welcome to Take Two Creations. Another episode on this one is on passion. So it's holiday season, but this holiday season is not the same as uh, every holiday season because of COVID. Obviously, usually around Christmas time, uh, around this time, we will have a, a family over. There will be about twenty to thirty people coming over for dinner on Christmas Day, and we will have a huge celebration. So, you know, sometimes. Uh, uh, mostly focused on eating and drinking <laughs> uh, and uh, some some entertainment, obviously singing and music and all those things go along with that. But this year is going to be a little bit gloomy because we may not be able to get all of our favorite people uh, under one roof. So entertainment was a big part of our celebration this year. Uh, we don't have the same level of celebration. So one thing I was uh, thinking that during these Christmas holidays and Thanksgiving and uh, holiday season in general, people consume a lot of uh, alcoholic beverages, especially wines. And I have found that I am so lacking in that area. <laughs> Every time I go looking for wine bottle, I do eeny, meeny, miny, mo basically. And uh, that's how <laughs> I make my wine. I know a couple of names uh, of type of wines and that's uh, and if it's a right price range i will buy it i have no idea which one to buy what to look for and how to do this so we, we thought why not why not invite some experts uh, people who are passionate about wine and let them teach us educate us because this year we will get time to spend with our spouse or children who are living with us uh, so uh, we can spend more time thinking about uh, how to pick good wines and experiment with them. So that can be part of our entertainment, which we uh, otherwise will be missing. So without further ado, let me ask uh, uh, my co-host, Chetna. Chetna, why don't you introduce our guests? Uh, thank you, Manoj, and welcome to Take Two Creations once again. And we are talking about holidays, fun, making merry. Uh, and like Manoj said, um, we are talking about wines today. Wine, what is wine? Wine is an alcoholic beverage made from grapes. That's all we know. And the earliest of wines actually came from ancient China in 7000 BC. That's all I know about wine from Google. And I can Google a lot of other things about wines, but I like to talk to people who are actually expert and are passionate about wine and they have learned a lot about it wine making, why certain kind of wine, why do we drink wine, what are the benefits or pros and cons of drinking wine. So here we have two expert guests today. First one is Reshma, who is joining us as a, as a wine lover. And she also plans all her travel itineraries based on wines from certain region. She happens to be my daughter-in-law, very proud of her. <laughs> and she's in a minute, <laughs> I love you too. And in a minute, she'll introduce herself and tell us more about her passion and wine for wine. And then we have Alyssa with us. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. And, and she is actually a physical therapist by profession, but I think her actual passion lies in wines. And she'll also talk about how she came about loving wine and what she does with it, the knowledge and the types of wines. So off to you, Reshma. Let's talk about wine and your passion. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be on take two. Um, I started liking wine, just getting really curious about it. I think around 2015, 2016, my first trip to Napa, um, I indulged, had a great time. I did not pay much attention to what they were telling me, <laughs> you know, what, I, what was in my glass. When, what really kicked it off, though, was um, we were going to Spain and, you know, we just had so much fun in Napa. We were like, maybe there's a Napa Valley of Spain. You know, we didn't even know that there's wine regions across the, all over the world. I just... So we're, we literally Googled Napa Valley of Spain <laughs> and found out about um, Spain. And there they don't really necessarily overindulge the way, <laughs> the way that we did in Napa. They really encourage you um, 
the winemakers to learn about it. And you could just see the passion in everybody's eyes. Yeah, so I pretty much found the wine region that's in Spain, made myself, made my way over there, met some awesome winemakers. They were super passionate. It was very different scene. It was all about the history. It was all about the family heritage, all about making a living. It was a very different feeling there. And, you know, I learned, that's when I kind of kicked off the whole, there's something to be said about the history, the culture, the way that they pair it so well with food. I loved everything about it. And I think that really kicked off my interest. And so since then, we've always kind of planned our trips around wine, um, decided to formalize education after a trip to France and learn as much as I can about it. So that's- Wow. So how many years ago was that, uh, Reshma? Um, my husband proposed in Spain, so 2015. <laughs> 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 so I remember it. <laughs> Good way to remember say- it. And I must say, it was one of the most beautiful wineries that I have seen where he proposed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the architecture was incredible, too. Yeah. Um, and Spanish yeah. wines are just amazing. So <laughs> after that, I decided to get my um, WSET diploma. And so I've been studying for that. You're done? Okay. You want to introduce uh, Lisa? Uh, yeah, I can introduce myself. Um, <laughs> so I'm Alyssa, Alyssa Wolf. I am a physical therapist. Um, I used to be a full-time physical therapist. Now I'm part-time. In 2015, uh, my husband and partner and I started Red Wolf Imports, which is a wine import company. Um, We actually, we got, we became interested in wine when we were in our early 20s. I was about 23 living in Miami. I'm not going to say when that was. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and we ended up, um, like most 23 year olds, not, you know, not necessarily paying attention to wine, but we'd occasionally buy a bottle from the grocery store and have it with dinner. Um, usually based on the label, if it had a monkey on it or some kind of animal, that was, that was how we would it. So for my birthday, my husband bought, um, wine classes. There was a local wine bar that was actually owned by a famous Dolphins football player, Jimmy Seflo, who was on the 1972 undefeated team. He decided oh. to buy a wine bar in Coconut Grove, Miami, and had a, had a knowledgeable wine director named Henry. So Henry would offer classes, and the first class that we went to was a Chardonnay class. And I said, well, I hate Chardonnay. I've only had like Chardonnay that tastes like popcorn covered in butter topped up with vanilla at, at weddings. And I, I don't understand how this is such a popular, uh, such a popular uh, wine, such a popular grape. So we took the class and it was very casual. He had a plate of um, a plate of different cheeses and went through different styles of Chardonnays from different regions. Um, I had no idea how wine was made from wines that were fermented in um, stainless steel and aged in stainless steel to a mix of stainless steel and barrel and then into into barrel fermented barrel aged and he taught us about each of those and showed us how they work differently with the food and how wine tasted differently with the food and that kind of kicked it off for us and then we began when we would buy a bottle which was still usually from the grocery store we would um like peel the label off, stick it in a notebook. I tried to find this notebook and though I can't, I couldn't find it. Wow. Uh, but basically like stick it down in the notebook and then write down our tasting notes about it and then go up and look, look up a little bit about the, uh, about the wine and see if we were, were right. Um, that was how we got invested personally. Um, from a business standpoint, we had both been interested in going into business to, to, um, starting a business together, but we really didn't know. We had no idea what we wanted to do. I came from a healthcare background. He was going to law school. Uh, at, we both at the time were uh, oddly enough doing um, mixed martial arts. So we were like, well, should we open a gym? But you know, <laughs> at like 6 a.m. and you're working at midnight if you open a gym. So it sounded like a horrible idea. <laughs> and after a vacation to South Africa, we were in wine country, saw how many wonderful wines were in South Africa at, at like very reasonable price points, price points that we were comfortable with, like, you know, $50, right. maybe up to $25. And after that trip, we were very excited to start buying South African wine. We lived in DC. 
uh, DC is phenomenal wine shops. So we thought, great, we'll just start, we'll just start buying South African wine. Let's, let's go see what's there. And we kept on finding the same, the same things over and over again. So in addition to the, those value wines, we were seeing these really expensive bottles, 50, 60, $70 from South Africa. So probably excellent wines, but just not in a price point that we really ever shopped in. Um, and if we did, that was a very, 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 very special occasion. So we saw that there was a bit of a gap in the market. And then um, my husband, fortunately, went to law school and looked up all of the tedious aspects of importing wine as far as licensing, legality. Um, his, his father, uh, my father-in-law, Kenny, uh, is a retired import-export attorney. So mm -hmm. we had connections with customs and with freight. So we were able to figure out the logistics. And then in um, 2016, we brought our first wines over from South Africa. And we've grown since and just recently um, brought over some wines from Portugal. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so in a matter of what five years uh, Reshma has become now certified <laughs> wine specialist <laughs> or going to be and uh, Alisa has started her uh, whole business uh, uh, importing wines from there so it's uh, but it takes several years of studying right uh, several years of uh, gaining and, uh, and absorbing all the knowledge to come to this level so for uh, keeping holiday uh, spirit uh, in, <laughs> in mind, how a person like me who, has, who only knows uh, Cabernet and uh, Malbec and, uh, and Merlot and uh, Chardonnay and uh, just a, a few names, uh, tell me how did you learn about what to pick and how to pick uh, wines, uh, red and white? What, when red, when white? So our perspective is, is actually probably a little bit different. Um, we, we started, I don't know, we started kind of realizing some trends because we started looking at the back label of wines. And I, mm -hmm. I swear this is what we actually did as much as this is self-promotion. <laughs> But we started realizing when we would look at the back label, there's always um, an importer sticker. I know it's hard to see on the screen, yeah. but there's always an importer sticker on, well, for us on the back label, if you're a really famous rich importer, it, it goes on the front. Right. Um, but for most of us, it's on the back. And we started realizing like, oh, all of these wines that we like are all imported by Kermit Lynch or are all imported by... Uh -huh. Oh, or um, that now that we're in the DC region, we've kind of realized that there are some other local importers. So for us, once you have an importer that you trust, even if it's a grape you don't know or a region you don't know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll love the wine, but you, you should know that it is going to be of good quality because they, mm. should, have, they should have standards uh. for pricing. And you might even get a sense for like, oh, this guy, Eric Solomon, I, I really tend to like his wine. So then you can mm. start to trust his palate a little bit too. So that's yeah. a maybe different perspective, but it's worth paying attention to because um, it helps you know if you're looking at that like $17 bottle and that or $17.99 and $16.99 and for all you can tell, it's the same darn thing. Right. And mm -hmm. one is someone you've never heard of who doesn't mean the wine is bad, but someone you've never heard of or some big company like Country Vintner. And then there's this other one that's maybe this local Italian importer, uh, Robert Kennedy imports, that you're like, oh, he has some really, I've had a bunch of his wines. His wines are really good. Then you'll kind of go like, well, I'm going to just go with the Robert Kennedy wine because I, hmm. I trust him. So. I see. Okay. But don't you reach that point after like having a lot of wine and after like experimenting, because this is the first time I'm hearing this that pay attention to the importers. Uh, I really have never paid attention to it. So yeah. for a person like me, how do I find out what's a good wine? Well, the, and the, I guess it did come from our little notebook. Um, so again, hmm. we, were doing pen and, we were doing pen and paper then, but okay. we did, especially if we liked something, we did we didn't initially write the importer down. This was kind of something we figured out. We would just write down the tasting notes and mm -hmm. then just from paying a little bit of attention. And again, we're literally sticking the labels in our notebook. We started to notice those trends. So yeah. as someone that's, as someone that's, um, 
you know, not at that point yet. What I would do is if you have a bottle and you're like, wow, this is fantastic. I only paid $15 for this. Turn it around, look at the back label and see who it is. And then you'll realize that you, st you start to, oh, it's another one of this guy's wines. I look right. at that and you notice, right. you start to notice that, that trend. So tomorrow you can't necessarily go into a store and be like, ah, there's my favorite importer. <laughs> um, right, right good habit to get into and uh, when, okay Resh knows a lot more about wine than I do um I'm I, I have taken formal wine education but not to that level and if I get outside of South Africa I I get I don't know as much so if I'm looking at you know French wines or German wines it's really helpful for me to go all right well I know I wanted a Riesling from the Mosul like I have maybe gotten to that point in my wine knowledge but now I don't know the difference anymore but I know okay. the importer, so I, I know you really like um, Malbacs, and you know that you yep. like Argentinian uh, Argentinian Malbacs. Love them. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Start, Me too. Open one, turn it around, look at who the importer is, and then yeah. that might be a good way to say, "Oh, well, now I'm going to try a Chilean um, a Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon from so and so because I I mm. trust their you know I trust their palate. Yeah. I trust their palate. right, right. Resh, uh, so now, your... Resh, you go and tell us a little bit about wine itself. Um, my thought process is kind of like a decision tree. So if I'm going into a wine shop, I first think, what is my price point? So, you know, what is the occasion? Is this a weekday? Is this a nice dinner? You know, price point varies based on all that. Then I think about, okay, if I know what food I'm going to have, I kind of know what pairs well with food. But if I don't know what food I'm going to have, then I think, okay, am I in, what am I in the mood for? Am I in the mood for a big, bold red? Or am I in the mood for a light, refreshing red or white? And they can, yeah, you know, you can have a big, bold white too. It's not, you know, mutually exclusive. But anyways, I figure out the style that I'm looking for. I figure out my price point. And from there, I start to look, if I don't know much about the region, I start to look at how specific the labels get on the region. So I know just a rule of thumb I have, and this is not, there's going to be fallout, you know, there's going to be exceptions, but my general idea is if it's a, from a warmer climate or a warmer place, it's going to be higher alcohol, probably more body, probably more tannic. If it's going to be, if it's from a cooler region and a colder region, I think higher acidity, fresher, lighter. Um, and that's kind of my thought process. Warm, big, bold, red, hot, cool, usually light, high acidity, fresh fruit. And so from there, I might pick up a bottle and I see, okay, it says California. That's very broad, right? And so likely they probably, care, like the wine producer probably doesn't care that much about you know, showing you something special. The grapes could be sourced from anywhere in California. It really doesn't tell you if it's cool or hot or whatever. So I look at, I try to get as specific as possible on the label too. So if I'm seeing, okay, Sonoma Coast in California, I'm like, okay, the quality is probably getting better now than just regular California wine. Um, they want you to know that it's from Sonoma. Then if it gets even more specific, like Russian River Valley, that's a, re a very niche region in Sonoma and it's in my price point. I know that it's gonna be a good wine because they really want you to know that it's from this Russian River Valley, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I try to look at how specific it gets, whether it meets my price point and the climate it likely is. And you can quickly yeah. Google the climate too. So if I'm looking at California wine, I think, like you said, it's uh, very much going into learning the region. That is uh, the most important thing. And the grapes. Uh, I know you said... Uh, yeah, the regions you learn. So, so region, uh, so California has, uh, you know, all these different kinds of wines. Uh, so do you pick, okay, I like Cabernet versus uh, Merlot versus... How do you decide, okay, this is the better grape type or the uh, than the other i mean i just typically pick can gauge quality based on the label also are they really explaining out like all the stuff that they did with the grape like if they're saying you know um 
like I noticed the Shannons usually say we use free run juice or if they're really showcasing sometimes how they made the wine, it means they want you to know they didn't really cut corners. If they're really getting specific about the region, then they want you to know these grapes are really expensive <laughs> and really high quality. And otherwise, they would say California wine or, you know, Australia wine because they don't care or want you to know like where the grapes are sourced from because likely uh. you know, the machine harvested <clears throat> was not, um, not a lot of care was taken into making the wine, not a lot of, you know, techniques, things like that. So I try to, I mean, in my mind, I look at how much information are they offering up on the label? Um, mm -hmm. If I don't, if I'm like in a territory where I don't know anything about like that region or something like that, you know, um, not all labels are like this, like a lot of natural ones that are great, have really funny fun, quirky labels, and they're trying to make it less intimidating in that sense too. But a lot of times like great wines that want to, they want to showcase, you know, right. Okay. We didn't cut corners. The more they brag about, the better it is. So, <laughs> so I have a question. I have a question for Rish. Um, people like me and Manoj are not as passionate as you and Alyssa about any kind <laughs> of wine or labels or brands or information. We just want to make merry, right? Most of the time, just have some wine and have fun. Like to a layman, like me and him and our friends, uh, most of the times, especially I would say in our gatherings, uh, people go for scotches and go for all these uh, vodkas and, you know, you know, those kind of alcohol. So wine has not really picked up so much as like a choice beverage or a choice alcohol. Um, I drink wine because I really like the taste of Cabernet. That's how I got hooked to wine. But my question is how, how a layman like just goes to a store and picks up a wine. But today I tried a wine, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, what? How do you pronounce this, Alyssa? K -A the, the, the winery name, it's okay. Uh, so it's Dutch. So they would say kapzit. Kapzit. Okay. Kops. I would just say I just say capsic. I'm from Kapsik. Long Island. There's no <laughs> like it's just capsic for me. Yeah. So I tried this capsit and I tried the Chenin Blanc. Mm -hmm. That's uh, by your import, uh, Red Wolf Imports, mm -hmm. and I find it so full bodied that I'm not missing my red wine right now. <laughs> I like red wines because they are more full bodied than like a lighter, very uh, clear, light, liquidy wines, whites. So, so that's what I'm saying. Like if I hadn't tried this, I would say, okay, I only want red. But how do you decide? How do you decide for, for me and him? <laughs> <laughs> well, you already know more. You're, you're like... A, and this is true of a lot of people. People don't give themselves credit on how much they know. You already know that you like a fuller bodied wine with flavor. Yes. You don't like something really watery. You're not gonna like a thin watery wine. You're probably not gonna like like a super, super tart wine. And right. having that information is helpful. Um, you know, walking blind into a shop, looking at bottles, it's hard to know without, without studying. But if you do get to know a wine shop or a liquor store where they have some folks in there who, who are helpful, then ah. you can just go and say, you know, I'm more of a red wine drinker, but I want to try a white because it's 107 degrees outside or I'm mm -hmm. having oysters. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I, I really I like red wines. I want something a little bit fuller bodied. Right. Whereas someone else might say, you know, I really like things that are, I like wine that is kind of sweet or mm -hmm. I like wine that dries the heck out of my mouth and like, you know, makes me want to eat a steak. So <laughs> you know what you like that gives you, that gives you a lot of guidance already. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So on that topic, one thing uh, I know Reshma, you said that uh, something about pricing and uh, Lisa, you said it too. Pricing, how important is pricing uh, when you're purchasing wine in, mm -hmm. in the sense I read some uh, uh, articles or some interviews and things, and there are experts who claim that price has nothing to do with a good or bad wine, right? Uh -huh. uh, where is the correlationship between price and the quality of uh, the wine? 
who wants to take it? Resh? Yeah. Um, my, so everybody's budget is different, but my budget personally, I kind of put myself in the $15 to $25. That's kind of my range of mm -hmm. what I buy wines at. Um, I feel like that's from just tasting around, from learning what I like. I find that it's around the $15 mark that the winemaker is not cutting corners. They're not, um, no, they're not. doing great care. <laughs> they are spending time. They are doing what they, you know, what should be done. That said, I don't always like, I have 10, like, 10 to 15, it can get, you can find good bargain bargains there. And there are really good quality wines like from there too. But usually like that's kind of my range. And then if it's a really special occasion, then I'll bump it up to like $30. But typically I try not to go above $30. Um, so that's just rule of thumb for me. Everybody has a different threshold. Um, I had expensive wines too, like in the hundreds of dollars as well. And it's an experience. and you know, I was very anti against it until I knew everything there is to know about that wine, the history, the producer, why it's special, why it costs that much. Like I, and then even then those bottles, I have just enjoyed between Samurth and I at home alone. We spend a lot of time analyzing the wine. We spend a lot of time writing about it. Um, smelling mm. the aroma is like very mm. present in the moment. It's not the one, it's not a wine that selfishly I probably share with friends or have <laughs> a large group of people where I'm not going to appreciate it. Or right. <laughs> but if anybody is like, I like wine because it makes me be mindful. It makes me be present. It makes me think and analyze and critique. And, you know, you're so much on the go, go, go about the next thing. Like just focus on what's in the glass in front of you and it makes me just slow down and that's i think one of the main reasons i fell in love nice. with wow very very I well loved said it. <laughs> very I well said you thank are. you so much thank you so much. <laughs> thank you Rish. Alyssa, what has been your experience in terms of pricing um it's varied and i'm gonna talk about not this year because for me personally um premium wine sales have been way way down which i completely i mean i completely oh. understand when this all started everyone was not looking to pay attention or be mindful um you know i'm sure vodka did well um <laughs> you know ever clear <laughs> Um, so aside from, I would say aside from 2020, um, historically, like in years past, I would say my, um, my biggest sellers, my two biggest sellers are the Capsic Shenan that you all have. And mm. then there's a wine. So that wine, um, low price point, we're looking at around $12 a bottle retail, um, high end in Montgomery County, just because of the way that the county does things. Uh, you're looking at like $16 a bottle. Um, that, that is my biggest seller. And then my next biggest seller is a wine. Um, it's actually by, I don't have a bottle of it at home. Um, but just, this is just a label that you might see, or I know Rush has had their wines. Uh, Babylon, what does it say? Babylon what? Babylon Storin. Uh, okay. They mm. have a red blend that retails around $24.99, which is not inexpensive by any means. Mm. And that's a wine that I sell a lot when people get to taste it. Um, even beer, like that people who are like, I only drink beer. I'm not into wine. I've gotten them hooked on that wine. Um, that's my second best seller, even though it is at a higher price point. Mm. And I think both of those wines, once you taste them and get familiar with them, you realize how good they are for the price. And now, you know, you're like, well, this is a white I'm comfortable with and I'm not spending that much money on it. So I'm going to go for that one. Mm. Uh, so I find I, kind of what Rush was saying too, I do find it's that price range works probably the best for me. When I get up to my more premium wines, um, I have a wine, um, actually it's, it's the one in the wrapping behind me. That is an expensive special occasion wine. It's only made in certain vintages. That's like a $70 bottle of wine. Wow. They only sell, you know, I may only sell a few six packs of that in a year. Range. Wow. So the bottle behind you looks very interesting. Can we have a look at that? 
So what this, is this? Um, this is actually Copsit, same ah. winery. Stetler is their last name. That's the family's last name. Uh. And they have three wines in this range. They do a Pinotage, a 100% Pinotage. Uh, mm. They do the Pentagon, which is a Bordeaux blend. So this is Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Bordeaux, and Cabernet Franc. And mm. then they do another one that is um, a blend with Pinotage in it. So they only make these in exceptional vintage years. So years where the weather conditions are perfect, where, you know, there's nothing that happens to mess up the wine during, during harvest and everything. Uh, so they had a 2012, a 2015, a tw and then a 2017. Um, mm. So they don't make them every year. I mean, this bottle, this probably weighs like five pounds. <laughs> um, it's a heavy bottle. It's a wine that can age 10 or 15 years. So it's a, you know, birthday, it's a, it's a, a gift bottle, a special occasion bottle, an anniversary bottle, that kind of thing. It's probably not something that just on Tuesday with pizza, you're just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about the years, I, I read somewhere on Google that um, older the wine, better it is. That's one thing. But they say when the wine gets like really old, it gets like murky and and uh, somewhere in the world, I don't remember where in the world there is like a hundred year old bottle of wine that they have it in a museum somewhere. Resh might know. And now it's become all murky and I don't know how Who's it is that? inside. I won't even drink it after a hundred years, <laughs> but they are keeping it as, as, as a souvenir <clears throat> or something. So I wanted to ask you guys like older the wine, is it better? It depends. Like it really depends on the intent and the grapes used, the oak, whether oak was used, how the wine was made. So it um, for white wines, it depends if it's high acidity, like Riesling, those age beautifully and they get like a gorgeous honey aroma and flavor. Um, mm -hmm. with, and then for red wines, um, not all red wine can age. Some are meant to be consumed right as soon as they hit the market. Um, the Bordeaux blend that definitely should be aged and I, I can imagine it tastes amazing with some age um, probably used oak I'm assuming um, they then with that age five ten years and so on um, you pick up a lot more earthy flavors you get more leather you get um, the fruit becomes less fresh fruit more dried fruit I mean, Alyssa could probably sell it better than me, but <laughs> um, wine just, it tastes amazing once it, when you have the right kind of wine that's aged over time. But yes, they can peak too. So if you're not storing it in the right conditions and it's been, you know, like stored in a, on your windowsill where it's been exposed to light for, <laughs> you know, 20 something years and you haven't thought about it, like it's, Probably not going to be any good. So, <laughs> okay. That are past peak too, and um, that's always a bummer when that happens. But so, <laughs> so now let's is... talk about the glasses, please. <laughs> yeah, before we get to the glasses, uh, okay. one thing okay. I was going to ask the red wines. So when we say aged, they have to be aged uh, in the winery itself, generally, right? Or in a, as you said, in a proper uh, uh, temperatures in a wine cellar or somewhere. It has to be aged in a proper setting, proper uh, conditions. Uh, but age is important only for certain red wines, not all of them. Uh, and uh, for white wines, it doesn't matter really. For white wines, it really uh, aging is not important because they are not done in uh, oak barrels mostly. No, go ahead. No? A really, uh, this does not apply 100% of the time at all. But in general, if you look at a wine bottle and it's clear, like, um, again, this doesn't always apply. This is clear. So mm -hmm. light can get through and light can affect this bottle. So like the Shannon, the Shannon bottle, it's not mm -hmm. clear, but it's like a light green and yes. it's not very dark. It's not very, you know, it's not very opaque. Um, whereas like my Pinotage, so th this part of it is empty and it's still fairly dark. Usually darker wine bottles are, are indicate that the wine can handle aging a little bit. Um, I would say in general, something that you're getting on the shelves between 15 and $25, you probably don't have to go do a whole lot of research about how long should I age this? Should I, 
Is this a grape that can age? How was the wine made? Assume that most stuff on the shelves that's <laughs> at a reasonable price point, you can probably drink now or hang on to for a couple of years. Um, oh. It's a clear, clear bottle and it's a white wine oh. and it's like from 2007 and the wine is turned orange like kind of assume that that got left on the shelf and you know got missed yeah, by somebody. but if the wine is in a clear bottle and still looks pretty pristine um and it's within the last couple of years that's probably completely fine if you're gonna spend 70 80 dollars on a bottle or more then i would look into okay what because you can find this information on google for most like uh, for us all of our wines um uh, we have them all listed on our website and it has aging information so if you're mm -hmm. going to spend that much money on a bottle of wine, I would look into it and see like, hey, when should I drink this so that you don't wait too long or open it yeah. too soon. But the most wine on the shelves is is for drinking relatively soon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Rish. That's a good information to know. Like you cannot just store it. Rishma, you were saying something? We didn't well, hear you. I was you. saying like um, first white wine can definitely be aged and they can taste phenomenal um, when they are aged. So... For example, when Samarth, my husband, graduated residency, we got a bottle of 1990 Dom Perignon champagne. Mm -hmm. And that was like a, almost like a 30 year old champagne. It was just amazing. With wow. It. Yeah. Um, so white wine, champagne can be aged. Can be aged. Um, okay. Red wine, I feel like when you're getting into the 50s and 60s, that's turning kind of almost into an investment and they're encouraged, likely encouraging you to age it too. I mean, you can have it earlier and it'll still be great. It'll just taste different than it would aged. And you might even pr prefer wines that aren't, like you might prefer the fresher taste and the more tannic right. rather mm -hmm. than the tannic right. happen. Right. Or like you might not like leather and earth and you like the really ripe, um, cherry, raspberry, blackberries, like all of those notes that the red wine presents um, at a young age, even if it is expensive. It should be good quality, um, no matter when you drink it <laughs> at that price. <laughs> but if you're, if you really like aged characteristics, then um, they encourage you, you know, age it and you can. Right, because sometimes uh, when I go to these wineries, like local wineries, they have some very young wines, uh, which are yeah. really fresh on flavors. You know, they are like bursting with flavors of everything they have in it. Sometimes, you know, like any kind of berries or anything, you can like really taste it. So yeah. even the young wines are sometimes very refreshing and uh, yep. good. <laughs> okay, Chetna, you can jump to your uh, glass. Uh... Yeah, I want to know about, pick up your glass, please. This is I my have glass. two of them. He has two kind of glasses. You have two kind of glasses. Now let's talk about glasses. <laughs> so first do cheers. cheers. <laughs> and then talk about glasses. Why different shapes? How different shapes and what kind of wine is used to have different shapes of glasses? So whoever wants to go, I want to know. All right. I'm I am not a specialist on glassware and I break things. So I don't have much expensive glassware um, in my house. I, I have some that were a wedding present and we're like terrified every time that we use them. Um, this is a glass that I use a lot. So it's, it's pretty basic. But what I like about it is that the, the bowl is a little bit wider than, than the top, than the rim. So what's nice about that is it kind of like captures the, uh, the aromas and flavors in. Because um, I'm drinking a rosé. This is a relatively simple wine. If I had it in a big open glass, it would just kind of, the air would get so much contact with it and it would just kind of like fade a little bit. But this is preserving it a little bit. Um, and then also, I, I do, just from a non-technical -te standpoint, I like that the stem is kind of narrow and graceful. It feels pretty in my hands, but that's just a personal, a personal preference. <laughs> Um, and I actually bought these at a local winery. This is a Polish brand, um, Krosno. At the winery, this was a $3 glass. So I'm wow. sure if you were buying them wholesale or, you know, buying a, a set instead of just a handful, they'd probably be pretty affordable. So you can find decent glassware at, at good prices. 
Yeah, I mean, I have, I drink my wine mostly out of this glass. It's a universal glass. It's called universal glass. From um, also, I don't know what country it's from, but it's not the US. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I really like it too. The thin, the thin stem makes it feel pretty in my hands as well. It's like an experience really. But um, I just think that glassware does matter and you know the shape of it really matters with how what aromas you're going to pick up um your whole how it's going to taste it really I think matters but like Alyssa said you don't have to spend an arm and a leg to find nice glassware that's going to elevate the experience for you so um I do have a couple of like glasses based on um like you can get as specific as you want. There's burgundy glasses out there. There's Bordeaux glasses. Like there's so many. Get out of here. Kind of wine. Um, I use my universal glass because I can't like afford to buy every single type of wine glass there is. <laughs> I spend a pretty penny on my universal one. I will say that. Um, but I use it for everything. And then the last thing I want to say about wine glasses is I really like champagne in a regular wine glass. <laughs> So, like, I don't like them in a flute. Really, yeah. really stop doing that. You can't pick up anything. You can't really pick up the taste. You can't really tell what it is you're even drinking. I And it has so much to offer. So. I am so much at, uh, in agreement with that statement. The person <laughs> who created flute should be shot. Probably he's dead or she's dead. <laughs> it was a he for sure and he's dead. <laughs> Proud, because it's so hard to even drink it, especially with my big nose, you know, it gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> so just, <laughs> I, I hate those. <laughs> so I really encourage everybody to just drink it out of a regular glass. You, but you're paying so much money for champagne. Like you want yes. to taste what you're, you know. Yeah. yeah. We'll do that tomorrow. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one thing I noticed, uh, uh, Chitna, one second, I just want to finish my thought on it. So one thing I noticed uh, since you were talking about the glasses with the stems, they look pretty in women's hands because you have nail polish with beautifully done nails and all those things. I think that's why they invented <laughs> those stems. Uh-huh. So that you, you agree there, right? <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> I um, personally don't like the stemless glasses. I mean, they're fine, but the only reason that I think people don't prefer them is just because if your wine is cool, um, it tastes best at a certain temperature and your hand warms it up. And if you're drinking it for a long time, it's going to not taste that great when it's hot. (laughs) Good point. Good Good point. point. Yeah. It's like a beer koozie. The reason you right. put beer in the koozie is so you don't warm the cheap beer. And not right. that it matters. With, I mean, not that it has to be cheap wine, but if, right. I'm, if I'm holding my rosé like this and it's a hot day, it's going to get, it's going to get warm. Yeah. yeah. You're just like ru- ruining it for yourself more. But, <laughs> and Manoj and I are point. guilty of holding this. <laughs> I mean, we all that's, yeah. but thank yeah. you for educating us. I'm going to hold it like this now. Unless you're going to finish it fast and you don't care. <laughs> and you can show off your nails as well. I mean, you get to, you get to have fun with the swirl a little yeah. bit. Ah. Swirling takes up the aromas and then you put your, you kind of put your nose, stick your nose in it, take a few sniffs and you pick up immediately, you know, what the wine is trying to show the aromas. Mm. Oh. our taste like a lot of what we taste comes from the comes from the smell just think about if you have a head cold it's so hard to taste anything ah. and I'm sure I bet especially with the the pinotage where it's a little bit more obvious if you just smell it and then you give it a good swirl and you don't have to hold it I mean you can put it on you know just on the table you can do something like that because that way you're not you know um if you give it a good <laughs> And then smell it again. It, it, it should just smell like a little bit more of the same stuff. So should we store a red wine in the fridge for outside? And the same with white wine. What do you suggest? I don't see why. You mean once it's open? Mm-hmm. Yeah, once it's open. Yeah, in the summer, I do. If I have an open bottle of red, I do store it in the fridge. And I'm not talking. Um, let me back up. If it's an every kind of an everyday wine, if it's a special wine, we're probably we're probably gonna either finish the bottle or um, yeah. my, 
my basement's pretty cool, even in the hottest days of the summer. So it stays in like that 60, 70 degree range. So we'll just stick in the basement. But mm. for example, if I am going out into the market and um, tasting buyers on, you know, a range of wines and I'm going out each day, I do store them in the fridge overnight in the summer um, just to preserve the freshness a little bit. And they'll warm up throughout the day in my bag, um, both for red and white wines. And then the red, I would just pull out if I, if for personal um, drinking, I would just maybe pull it out like 30, 40 minutes before we were going to have it. Interesting. In the winter, I, we keep our house at 67. So in the winter, I, I don't tend to, and they, I mean, they seem to be, they seem to be fine. Yeah. If I, if I remember it correctly, a while back, uh, I'd heard that red wine, if you uh, put that in the refrigerator, probably probably uh, wine uh, connoisseurs will kill you or shoot you right there because red wine was never supposed to be stored in a refrigerator. Is that not true? I put it in the fridge. You do? Okay. <laughs> um, I put it in the fridge, open it back up for dinner the next day, pour myself a glass. I mean, I don't, my rule is more don't keep it longer than a week. Like don't, um, in the fridge like I try to finish it within a week because after it's been open it's been exposed to oxygen each day each passing day it's losing more and more of its freshness and becoming more oxidized and then by that point it's eventually not very not bringing much to the table mm. it, it's just like with food the fridge slows down that process okay so, ah. now I wouldn't take I wouldn't store a sealed <laughs> bottle of red wine in the fridge I would yeah. just say like oh I'll buy this and I'll save right. it and just keep it there indefinitely. But once right. then, yeah. How yeah, good are those wine refrigerators? Oh, I love You them. know, one of those wine. They're warmer though. They're not, I'm not sure what the temperature of a fridge fridge is, but it's quite cold. Mm -hmm. um, wine fridges for red wines will usually range between like 55 and what, 65 degrees? Is that right? Right, right. Um, so, and that's just, that's just to have, so you don't have fluctuations, just so mm -hmm. it's not Okay. If your basement is around that range or mine's a little bit warmer, like that's fine too. So one thing I've seen uh, going to some of the wine stores, they have some kind of a rating or some kind of number like 90, 91, yeah. 92 or something like that. Is that of any use? Is that meaningful or is it uh, universal or is it uh, somebody created uh, one of the exporters said, hey, let's start putting in some uh, deep, good numbers there and it will sound good. So what do you know about that? Either one of you, who's going to speak first? Um, I, I would just say from a quality standpoint, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean quality because it is just that taster's opinion that uh. should be tasting objectively and trained and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, as a consumer, it's just a piece of information for me. It's not what I, it's not what I base everything on. Uh. If for me as somebody selling wine, if I have a really expensive bottle, it helps to have that like wine spectator score or that 95 or, or whatever. It does help for selling. But personally, that's not how I make a buying decision. So la but last question for me, and uh, uh, Chetna might have her own. So for, for me, uh, the wines are like basic types, your Cabernet versus Malbec versus uh, Merlot versus Chardonnay. Uh, it's all personal taste or are there certain grapes uh, better than the others or... Uh, and also the regions, uh, what are the preferred, uh, maybe both of you can say, what are your preferred regions uh, and what are your preferred grapes? So what should we uh, try it out that we might not have tried? We only know Ca Cabernet or Merlot and, uh, and Malbec, that's it. So what do we do after that? <laughs> no, I mean, it's all pers personal preference. There's no grape that's better or worse than another i mean there are certain grapes historically that have been mass produced over another because they just are more rigorously grown and um you know like prosecco for example like it's mass produced it's everywhere it's easy to grow it's not um with that said it doesn't have very complex 
you know, flavor profile, but Merlot, the ones you listed off are very good um, and it can be phenomenal. It's really about how the grower did in uh, making sure that they ripened appropriately. So they're not overly ripened or under ripened Cabernet Sauvignon. I, that's a kind of a tough grape to grow and that's why Napa is so, Napa Cab is so expensive. <laughs> that's, you know, the uh. because these grapes are so challenging to get perfectly ripe. I think I, I personally have figured out that I tend to like, um, more often than not, grapes that are a little bit higher in acid, um, whether it's a red or a white grape. And part of the reason for that is 80% of the time I try to cook relatively um, healthy food. And if I'm making fish or I'm making chicken, for me, I enjoy the matching better if the wine and the dish are, are kind of like at the same level like that. Um, but that's just a personal preference thing. I do think it's helpful for everybody who's decided, you know what, I like wine. Right. You don't have to go learn anything or everything, but at least start to recognize, oh, I really like these Malbecs or I, I really like yeah. cabs or I like wines that are full bodied or, oh, I don't, I don't like these wines that are so like drying and just start to realize that like, oh, I like reds that are not so tannic and are a little higher in acid. Oh, I like Pinot Noirs. Um, all right, I like Pinot, what, what else should I try? Oh, I like, I like Beaujolais, what's in that? And then you start to learn what you like and then you can always narrow it down as much as you want or not just enjoy, enjoy that glass of wine. Um, but I would say just always be willing to try something new, especially yeah. when you can do you know, free tastings in stores again. Um, you know, I sell Pinotage. A lot of people have a bias against uh, a bias against that grape. I would just say, be always, always be willing to try something. It's always okay if you don't like it, but you never know what you're going to fall in love with. I never so heard of nice. a Pinotage in, until today. So thank you for introducing us to this. <laughs> so we both got so, a bottle of Pinotage. So thank you. We'll yeah. try it. <laughs> I also used you all as an excuse to open a bottle of Pinotage, um, and I am, or we ordered some um, Texas barbecue from a local restaurant, so that, nice. in South Africa, they like to, uh, they do their own barbecue, it's called a braai, B-R-A-A-I, and it's just grilling meat over fire, so I figured it's way too cold to uh, do a cookout, so I figured we would just uh, buy nice. it. Nice. I like that. Nice. Uh, nice, nice. So it sounds like uh, uh, picking wine or, uh, or uh, selecting wines is very much like music, right? Everybody has their own taste and you have to develop the taste. You have to acquire the taste for whatever suits your senses, right? Uh, uh, is that a good analogy? Yeah. yeah, but I think at the same time, we don't have to be really experts, just like yes. in music, to appreciate it. Uh, but kind of be willing to try the kind of taste that like excites us or yeah. makes us happy. Mary, again, coming to the holiday theme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, like you had your last question, I'm going to ask my last question as well to both of sure. you. Sure, go ahead. What are the pros and cons of wine? Um, I mean, I would say cons. One is that this is true of, I think, a lot of things. Um, as you learn more and you start to understand what, um, what those quality indicators are, you do tend yourself starting to spend a little bit more. And I'm not talking $200 a bottle, but right. whereas, you know, college me was very happy with Arbor Mist strawberry wine at, you know, $7.99 a bottle. Um, now me is, is, is usually spending more between that 15 and, and $25, um, uh, uh, price on a, on a bottle of wine. Um, so you do end up spending a little bit more. Um, obviously if you drink too much of it, you're going to have a real nice headache in the, in the morning, but as your physical therapist, I recommend always having water as well when you have wine. Um, I think pros, I think Rush said this beautifully. I mean, it really, it, if you choose that you want to be mindful and be present, and that doesn't mean taking notes necessarily, but just, you know, giving it a swirl, smelling it. And for that, 
few seconds, you're not doing anything else. You're not scrolling through your Twitter feed. You're not taking, you know, you're not watching TV. And then you take that sip of wine and then maybe you have that bite of food and you see how they go together. And it's just, you're, fo you're focused in on one thing and it's really nice to be very mindful um, and present. Wow. So well said. Thank you. a lovely effect of merrymaking as a <laughs> little effect. So. That's what we're Thank here you. For. That, was, that was good. That was good. Vesh, you have uh, anything to add? Pros and cons. Pros and cons. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Alyssa. You, um, you're as you learn more and you learn what you like and don't like, or what quality indicators are, you definitely start to expect more, <laughs> and so you start to spend a little bit more than you know the barefoot Australian wine or whatever <laughs> wine, yellowtail <laughs> that I was buying. In but Colorado. nothing wrong with those either, right? No, I mean it's okay. And then the other thing is the other con is I mean, you just have to have balance. Like I, I was yeah. when I first started getting into the hobby, I was drinking a lot. I was so excited to try different kinds of wines and more, like I'd read about a region, I'd want to go out and buy it right there and then like, you know, but also with that, you have to balance your healthy lifestyle, like make sure you're working out, make sure you know, you spread it, spread it out and um, you know, you can gain a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> If you drink a lot of wine, I gained a lot of weight, and then it took me a lot of time to lose that weight. Um, and then uh, the pros, I mean, I could just go on and on forever about, about it. The mindfulness has been the best thing for me. I was, I feel like I was, especially in the early to mid-20s, like right out of college, just really uh, wanted to prove myself and always thinking about the next thing in my career, the next thing in my husband's career of getting through training, like the boards, the residency, like I wanting to buy a house, wanting to get married. Like I just was like rushing through my twenties and I felt like I was kind of burning out. And then I sort of found refuge in wine of it making me slow down, making me appreciate the present, making me appreciate the process like not everything has to be about the next step. And so wine was kind of that, I don't know, angel <laughs> um, that forced me to slow down. Also with traveling and um, I mean, it, it, you can't travel right now in COVID, but the wine glass can sure as hell take you there and <laughs> really lets your imagination run wild. I mean, every part of the world makes wine. Every country in the world, I think pretty much makes wine. You get to learn about the history, you get to learn about the culture, you get to learn about the people. A lot of it is passed down through generations. It's, you know, so it's really expanded my horizons and arts, cultures, food, and appreciate a whole lot more than I did before. So. Wow. Nice. nice. Love that. <laughs> so I want to raise a glass, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful year do some merrymaking, enjoy your uh, Christmas, and enjoy your wine, and entertain yourself the best way you can among, uh, I mean, uh, among your loved ones. And given the conditions we, we are in, I think we are able to drink wine that we should be thankful. <laughs> Happy Cheers holidays, everybody. Happy holidays.